Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, welcome back. Um, we're here to uh, discuss the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle and sort of uh, say say how it's derived one more time. It's uh, it's an important result in quantum mechanics, so it's important for you to uh, understand uh, what it means and how it's derived. Um, so, by way of summary, uh, if if we go back to the last lecture. Um, we, we make extensive use of these Fourier transform pairs. These Fourier transform pairs allow us to take a function in real space and transform it to a, a wave function in K space. Uh, and then uh, conversely, if we know phi of K, we can get back to psi of X by uh, performing the inverse transform. Uh, this is a, uh, the, the mathematics behind this requires you to evaluate an integral that's, uh, 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 that runs over all space, and it also requires you to uh, pick a value of k to insert into this integral uh, such that you get a value of phi uh, for that particular value of k. So for every k value that you, you can imagine, you have to basically perform this integral. Um, the, uh, the arithmetic, I think, is, is reasonably clear, but the intuition may not be. Uh, so what I'd like to try and do is just describe a much simpler situation to try to convey to you exactly what's going on. It's not mysterious. It's just simply a, a question of counting, uh, uh, counting cycles in a wave, basically. And so I want you to think about two waves. Uh, one is going to be a red wave that has a wavelength lambda sub 1. Uh, the other wave is going to be a blue wave which has a wavelength lambda to 2. And how are lambda 1 and lambda 2 related? Well, lambda 1 is going to be uh, lambda 0 minus some quantity delta lambda. You can choose whatever value of delta lambda you care to. Lambda 2 is going to be that same value lambda 0 plus, plus delta lambda. So lambda 2 is going to have a slightly, or the blue wave is going to have a slightly longer wavelength than the red, light, red wave. And how much difference the two wavelengths uh, are, 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 the two waves are going to be, is going to be determined by the value of delta lambda that you're uh, free to choose. So we can make some uh, formal definitions that are useful in this discussion. Right. First thing we can do is we can define a mean wavelength. Uh, we'll call that lambda with these pointed brackets. Uh, right. The mean wavelength is just going to be the average value of the wavelength. It's going to be lambda 1 plus lambda 2 divided by 2. And we can also describe the difference in wavelength between these two waves, between the red wave and the blue wave. And the difference in the wavelength is just going to be lambda 2 minus lambda 1, and you can work that out, and, you, and you, it ends up to be 2 times delta lambda. Okay? So, what happens when these two waves are in phase at, let's say, x equal to 0? Right? So here's, here's, a, here's a plot of, as a function of x, and we're going to synchronize these two waves at x equals 0 so that the red wave and the blue wave are exactly in phase. And as we move down uh, the x-axis, what's going to happen is the blue wave, since it's got a slightly longer wavelength, is going to tend to run ahead of the red wave, right? And after one complete cycle of oscillation, the difference between equivalent points on the wave is just going to be the difference in the wavelength lambda 2 minus lambda 1. Well, we already got an expression for that. It's 2 delta lambda. So this difference in peak, uh, peak position after one wavelength is 2 delta lambda. If we go through two complete cycles, we'll just pick up an, uh, an additional factor of 2 delta lambda. So the separation between the waves down here after two complete cycles is 2 times 2 delta lambda. And it follows that if we go down n cycles, right, uh, the, the shift in the wavelength between the red wave and the blue wave is going to be the number of cycles n times this quantity 2 delta lambda. Now something very interesting happens when this, this shift in wavelength uh, is just equal to uh, the average wavelength divided by 2. 
Uh, when that condition is met, then the red wave and the blue wave are exactly 180 degrees out of phase. And if I add the red wave to the blue wave at this point, I'll get zero, precisely zero. Whereas when I add them, uh, when they're in phase at this point, I just get twice the amplitude of the red or the blue wave, right? And so there's an envelope function, which I sketch schematically by this, this orange line, right? And this envelope function describes how the amplitude of the wave goes to zero as these two waves uh, systematically dephase one with respect to the other. So this, 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 um, these, the, these orange lines now are going to basically represent uh, to a very crude approximation a localization of a particle described by a free particle wave function. And we're going to say that this, uh, this wave is, is uh, comprised of the sum of two waves, which are slightly out of, out of phase, one with respect to the other. And we're going to say that the, the width of this wave packet, right, the width of this wave packet is basically going to be this integer number n cycles times the average wavelength lambda, where this average wavelength lambda just is basically describing how far down in x we have to go for these two waves to, to sum uh, to, to dephase and sum to zero. So we're just creating a, 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 a very crude wave packet without referring to all these Gaussian distribution functions just by looking at the, uh, the sum of two waves which have a slightly different wave, wavelength, one with respect to the other. So the arithmetic, I think, is pretty clear. If you sit down, I think anybody can work through it if, if you spend more than a few minutes on it. Um, uh, so it's, it's easy in real space to calculate this um, half width of the wave packet, which we call delta x. It's real easy to calculate that in real space. The question becomes, what is the equivalent uh, 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 spacing in k space uh, that, that gives uh, the width of this, this wave packet in k space? And so to work that out, I, I have to uh, define some quantities. I have to define the mean, mean wave vector, which is just going to be equal to 2 pi times the mean wavelength lambda. So this is, this is just a straightforward definition. And I have to ask the question, what is the difference in wavelength uh, delta lambda that produces a difference in wave number delta k? So if I know delta lambda, what's the equivalent value for delta k? And the answer to that question is I have to know how the... Uh, uh, the average wave vector k depends on the average wavelength lambda. So I have to take a derivative, first derivative of k uh, bracket with respect to lambda bracket. And when I do that, take the absolute value, I get this, this uh, pretty simple expression, which tells me the uncertainty in, in k space related to the uncertainty in, in uh, real space x. Um, so. Uh, you can then combine all this information and you can, you can sort of get a poor man's version uh, of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So what we're going to try and do, of course, is we're going to try and calculate the product of delta x times delta k. And uh, I worked through the arithmetic here. It involves about three or four steps of algebra. Uh, you, can, you can show at the end of the day that the spread in x times the spread in k uh, is equal to pi by 2, and this is for the simple case of just two waves, right? This is for the simple case of two waves. But it illustrates that this idea that Heisenberg uh, uh, derived using this Fourier transform pair is a very general uh, um, uh, result. It, uh, it just basically describes a, an interrelationship between two quantities that are very intimately related. And it just basically means that the width of a wave packet in real space and the width of the wave packet in K space are interrelated. In other words, you cannot arbitrarily change one without having to change another, uh, change the other in order to make the product equal to some constant value. So um, the more precise derivation of this result uh, makes use of these Fourier transform pairs. Uh, and um, uh, I just basically list, list the arithmetic here. So for those of you that, 
that want to see it one more time. It's, it's, uh, it's laid out in a very systematic fashion. Uh, I, I actually go through and I work out the integrals. Um, I, I show you the substitutions and the steps that are required. And at the end of the day, what you find is that if phi of k, right, if phi of k is given by um, a function that looks like this, then psi of x that follows um, is given by a, a function that looks like that. Okay, and this is this is of course the uh, the precise form of the wave function that we wrote down at the start of the previous lecture. Okay, so uh, it's important for you to understand uh, what these functions represent, and you should be able to interpret the different terms in these functions, and you should be able to write, for instance, the uh, real part and the imaginary part of this wave function psi of x, right, using Euler's uh, theorem. So those, those are things that hopefully you've, you, you, you learned from this, this lecture, uh, from this week of lectures, actually. This whole week is devoted to trying to get you to understand this interrelationship between uh, k and x. Um, uh, in this slide, Right, I just compare the quantum mechanical probability density to the standard form for this Gaussian distribution function. Here I put all the equations on one slide so it's a little bit easier to, to follow. Right, And at the end of the day, uh, you've got an uncertainty in the x position times the uncertainty in the momentum of, a, a, of the particle. Uh, that's often written as delta x times delta p, and that's got to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. The equal sign comes out when uh, when uh, we're dealing with these Gaussian shape wave packets. If the wave packet does not have the Gaussian shape, then the, the greater sign uh, comes into play. So I'd like to just uh, uh, build on this and work an example out, talk your way through it, make sure that you um, you understand the implications of, of Heisenberg's uh, principle. In introductory courses, it's very often used in screwy ways, right? They ask you to calculate the uh, uncertainty and position of a baseball uh, when the momentum of the baseball is known, right? And so in that sense, you're applying Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to a situation that really doesn't apply. We're not, we're, we're not worried about the quantum mechanics of baseball. So I, you know, the, the principle is, is somehow misstated, I think, in, in, in a lot of the introductory courses. Uh, but really the issue is if you can find an electron, and most of, most of the discussion in this course is related to uh, 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 energies and, and positions of electrons, if you can find the position of an electron, the implication is that if you measure the electron's position and simultaneously measure its momentum, right, uh, you can't uh, measure each with uh, high enough accuracy, right? Uh, uh, so you can get better equipment, you can make better measurements of position, better measurements of momentum, but if you make many, many measurements of position and momentum at the same time, there's always going to be a spread in those measurements. They're never going to be precisely one value or another value. There's going to be a spread, and that spread is going to be designated, or is going to be, uh, uh, um, uh, given by Heisenberg's famous equation. So in this case, we say we've got a, 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 an electron and we somehow localize its position to about a tenth of a nanometer. So a tenth of a nanometer is an interesting number because that's roughly the diameter of, a, of an atom. So uh, what we're going to worry about in the, in the next week of lectures is we're going to worry about electrons confined to small regions of space uh, to form something called a hydrogen atom. And a hydrogen atom has a radius on the order of a tenth of a nanometer or so. So it's possible to confine an electron to that narrow region of space. And the question is, uh, if we repeatedly uh, make measurements of the electron's position, we would uh, presumably always find it within that tenth of a nanometer. Um, at the same time we measure its position, we, sometime, we somehow measure its velocity. Uh, what would the distribution of velocities look like 
uh, given the fact that the electron is confined to this tenth of a nanometer. So that's how Heisenberg's in print, uh, uncertainty principle is supposed to be used, right? We know the uncertainty in position delta x, that's a tenth of a nanometer. Uh, we we want to find the uncertainty in momentum, and, and in particular, we want to find the uncertainty in velocity, but the uncertain, uncertainty in velocity is just the mass of the electron times the uncertainty I'm sorry, the uncertainty in momentum is just the mass of the electron times the uncertainty in velocity. We know what the mass of the electron is. We can look that up. And so what we find at the end of the day is we find that the uncertainty in, in velocity has got to be greater than about 1 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So that just simply means that if we did uh, made repeated measurements of this electron's position, we would find that it's local, localized at some point in space x0. Um, not really concerned what x0 is, but I am concerned about the width of the distribution of measurements that we make. So every time we make a measurement of position, we find that the, the electron is, is within plus or minus delta x of this quantity x0, and delta x, 2 delta x, describes the spread of this this uh, probability distribution, and, and, and that's on the order of a tenth of a nanometer for the way this problem has been stated. If we measure the velocity of the particle at the exact same instant in time um, with uh, instruments that can very accurately measure uh, velocities, what we would find is we would find that the velocity measurements would be centered about some value v0. I'm not particularly concerned about what V0 is, but the width of the measurements, right, the probability that we would measure a particular velocity, that would be spread in velocity uh, space by a distance 2 times delta V. So the width of this distribution would be about 2.2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So um, this is really a quantum effect, right? Uh, classically, you can measure the position with infinite accuracy and the velocity with infinite accuracy at the same instant in time. But quantum mechanically, that's not possible. There's a spread in velocities or spreads in momentum that are correlated with the spreads in position. So uh, that's fundamentally what Heisenberg's principle is all about. That's what it's trying to tell you. And it basically goes back to that Fourier transform pair uh, discussion. Everything is, con all the, all, this result is, is contained in the mathematics uh, that, that we've talked about throughout this, uh, this week of lectures. Um, so, what to remember from this discussion, right? Uh, if I can summarize everything in a very simple slide, this would be the slide that I would uh, probably use to, uh, uh, to try to make the point. Uh, and, and the point is that if the wave function in real space is localized, right, if there's a small uncertainty in its position, right, then there's going to be a large uncertainty in the momentum of, of that particle, and that corresponds to a large uncertainty in, in uh, uh, wave vector k. So that would mean that the, the appropriate phi of k that's, that, that's used to describe this psi of x that 5k would have a broad distribution of k vectors. If conversely, the particle in uh, the wave function in real space is delocalized, if it has a, a, a broad distribution of, uh, of uh, non-zero values over a large region in x, then there will be a small uncertainty in momentum in k space. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate phi of k um, that's required will now be confined to a narrow region. There will only be a, a small uh, region of, of k values that are uh, required in order to describe that wave function psi of x. So if you understand this picture, and if you, uh, you've had enough math background to appreciate those Fourier transform pairs, then I think we've accomplished something this week that's, that's, uh, that's pretty fundamental, right? We've been able to analyze this situation in pretty, pretty, pretty high detail, right? We worked through all the arithmetic and we've come up with a very fundamental result that is used over and over and over again in different areas of quantum mechanics. So it's important for you to at least understand uh, uh, what, 
what Heisenberg is talking about, and it basically comes back to a picture that, that looks like this. Okay, so next week what we're going to do is we're going to move from uh, one-dimensional uh, quantum mechanics, we're going to move into two dimensions, we're going to talk about uh, uh, electron states in, in two-dimensional areas, and then we're going to move into the three-dimensional problem, which uh, is, is known as the hydrogen atom, and we're going to spend about two weeks just discussing hydrogen atom, its uh, uh, energy eigenvalues, and its wave functions, because it teaches you uh, uh, an awful lot about uh, how quantum mechanics works, what quantum mechanics can predict, and what it can't predict. So it's a, it's a, uh, next week will be an introduction to, uh, to a really uh, interesting topic in uh, modern physics. So um, uh, think about this Heisenberg uh, uh, uncertainty principle and make sure you understand it and then come back next week ready to uh, move into uh, two and three dimensions. So thanks for your time and attention.